the central bank's remit is to keep inflation under control. And at some points in the economic cycle, this is done without any regard to any other area of the economy. This is one of those occasions when the markets are now pricing in recession in some areas. Let's catch up now with John Mayer from SP Angel. John, welcome. It's interesting, isn't it, because you operate in the commodity space. And normally when you get inflation, it's worth looking into commodities for some sort of uh, protection against what's happening. But in fact, as we'll see as we develop this interview, uh, we're looking at a, a, a picture at the moment where we have metals prices falling as well. What do you make of what's happening? Well, I think investors have got a number of things to look at. Firstly, what what what's the what's the smart money doing? Where, where where's the money flowing from a technical perspective, and then on a more fundamental perspective, what's what's going to emerge uh, as as a winner in from all this, and and where are we going fundamentally in relation to demand and margins and that kind of stuff? So right now we're in a very technical driven market where lots of people are saying, well, uh, they they the interest rates are going up, so they've they sold off some of their more speculative investments. That's why we've seen the Nasdaq down about thirty-three uh, percent. The U.S. markets have, have been driven lower by hot money coming out of those tech-driven stocks. So a few problems caused by the collapse of various brick, uh, cryptocurrencies, that kind of thing. Um, and I would describe this as as the Great Reset. Um, so yes, there's. There's risk off trade in commodities and commodity funds have been going from net long to net short and maybe even going back to net long again. Who knows where they go in the short term? But we see commodities as reasonably inflation proof or shall we say inflation protected. Of course, if we head into a big recession, commodities will come down like a lot of other things. But at the end of the day, a ton of copper is likely to increase in value in terms of, its, of, of inflation. Um, so I see, I see there is some protection in commodities here, um, and I also see demand growing in future years, especially for anything related to battery metals, to energy metals, because with what's going on in Russia, we, we have to uh, move away from Russian oil and gas, and in fact, we have to move away from very high, high oil and gas prices in general. And the way to do that is to develop more renewable energies, more efficient uh, ways of, of running our industry. So what happens then in terms of interest rates and the picture you paint? Because if interest rates go up, and indeed we've seen them, and in some cases very aggressively rise as well last week, we saw 75 basis points added to the Fed funds rate, for example. Uh, interesting enough, here in the UK, where we see an increased inflationary outlook, something like 11% they're now talking about for CPI, I know, the Bank of England, but they only raised by a quarter point. What's the big game here? It's not a game. It's a it's a game plan, I should say, uh, by central banks. What's in their mind? Because despite what I said at the top, they can't help but see in their rearview mirror the sort of damage that's being done with this case of raising rates. Yes, I think the Americans went for shock tactics, raising their their rates by seventy five basis points. That's three quarters of a percent. So that was a big old rate increase. Um, but I think you know that. They're very happy for governments to to inflate the the value of their debt away, um, and you know if you think back a couple of years ago, we were we were fighting against deflation, and that that deflation was coming in via cheaper goods and and huge competition from China, and now suddenly we've gone the other way. Well, we have a, our inflation is really dri being driven by very high energy prices. If we can get away from consuming all that oil and gas, then then all that inflation will come out of our system, all that energy driven inflation. And I think the American shock tactics is something that quite possibly they're going to have to reverse because the Americans don't want to stall their economy. The last thing anyone wants is stagflation. So so they really their main thing is to maintain jobs and to maintain economic growth. Now we have fantastic job creation in, in the US and the UK at the moment. I don't see that stalling anytime soon, but it is possible to to kill off economic growth. Um, so I think I think they're only really going to raise interest rates so that they can cut them again, maybe next year. What about manufacturers? What's going on there? Because they've got to cope with these higher prices, but at the same time, they're wanting to increase margins. And as you say, uh, the jobs market is very tight at the moment and there uh, must be a risk of a wage price spiral in all this, which is something else clearly the governments don't want to see happen. Um, how, do, how do manufacturers and those that consume these raw materials, these commodities we're talking about, uh, get round all this? 
Well, it, politicians say all sorts of odd things. And the idea of a politician telling a manufacturer not to raise, to raise uh, wages is, is frankly ridiculous. If a manufacturer or any service industry needs more staff or needs to keep those staff happy, they, of course, they're going to raise their, their, their wages. I mean, it, it's a different negotiation when it comes to unions and public sector, uh, government sector workers. Um, but when we look at many manufacturers are actually using this as an opportunity to raise their margins. And what we'll start to see at some point is, is the stock market revaluing and recognizing those manufacturers where this is working. So it's possible that volume, volume sales might fall. But actually, I think margins will increase because, OK, commodity prices are fairly steady right now. And if anything, they've come back a little. They've come back a bit. Labor's going up. Yes, energy's going up. But, but manufacturers hopefully will become more energy efficient. And then, of course, there's a bit of environmental compliance. So the costs there are, are always interesting. Um, but I think that it's quite possible that, that the Western world might see uh, improving margin growth. In, in, quite a, in quite a number of different industries. And that will help to, hopefully, help to offset any recession and any, any slowdown that, that is coming at us. Before we take a look at some of the commodities we're talking about and some of the companies as well that are being affected, we haven't really touched on China. Uh, I noticed over the weekend some of the interesting data coming through from China suggesting that Russia is actually selling a lot of oil now to, to, to China. And I believe at uh, reduced rates as well. Uh, so it means that China, which is one of the world's big consumers of, of raw materials because it is such a massive manufacturing hub. Um, but at the same time, China seems to want to lock down at every single possible opportunity when we hear about these relatively small numbers of increases in COVID numbers, which it still doesn't seem to be on top of, but has this draconian uh, attitude towards trying to conquer. How do you see the world, as we've just detailed it, coping with what's going on in China at the moment? Well, remember, China doesn't have a well-developed healthcare system in the way that we do. It, there's still a lot of traditional medicine. Uh, there aren't enough hospitals. And of course, the, the Chinese state feels that it, that it will be considered by the people to be responsible for all this. So they, they want to keep their COVID rates down because they're, they're, they're very uh, uncertain about, about the death rate. In fact, a lot of COVID cases in China are classed as, as migraines and things like that. So so they're not necessarily playing fair with the stats either. Um, and yes, they, they will shut down cities as soon as they feel that their hospitals are filling up in, in the way that our politicians did too. But of course, everything in China looks a little more, a bit more draconian and heavy handed. But in reality, they're doing the same thing. It's just that they, they take a slightly more extreme way of, of doing it. So I think we're going to see this cat and mouse game with COVID in China probably for another couple of years. It's not even over in the West. I mean, we, we have new versions of Omicron going around and, and quite high COVID rates. And that, of course, is impacting our labor force, uh, particularly with young people, because they, you know, some of these guys will have caught COVID three or four times now. Um, and each time that's going to be a week or two off from work and maybe a little bit of long COVID after that as well, reducing, reducing efficiency and performance. Um, so it's, it's pretty tough on everybody. Uh, and I think, you know, it's been, it, as we can see, it's a little bit difficult getting the economy in certain sectors back up to full speed. And we see that, at, you know, with Heathrow baggage handlers and in industries where it takes a bit of time to go through the accreditation and approvals process for, for, for the new staff. Yeah, that goes back to red tape. Don't get me started on red tape. We'll see whether or not we can maybe cover that in another interview at another time. But John, I just want to quickly catch up if I can with uh, a couple of areas of the market that I know you're intimately um, interested in. Uh, and one of these is uh, what's happening with the price of these base metals, copper. I'm going to pick up a chart of copper. Currently trading the London Metals Exchange at 88.83. I can't believe actually it's so long ago that when we were talking about uh, $10,000 a ton. In fact, that was the back end of last year. Uh, and then in, in November, it made uh, that first really big move above that line uh, and then went on to the recent highs at 108.45. Since then, we've seen this pullback. And it's not just copper. It's also um, iron ore as well, uh, where we're seeing um, losses uh, breaking um, some support recently, going below the 200 day moving average. Uh, what do you make of what's happening? Are you talking there about the fact we could well get some softness, but you see a reversal? What's it going to take to start to steer this back, these uh, areas of the markets back to positivity? Yeah, I think the key drivers for a reversal, and that they're always going to be key, key points in time, 
probably new Chinese stimulus. Uh, I noticed that the Chinese kept their their one year and five year um, loan rates uh, on hold today. So they decided to go. They didn't follow the Americans or, or the Brits. They they just said no. We 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 want to maintain growth. We'll hold our rates where they are. Although their rates are are generally higher than ours anyway. Um, so I think more stimulus there. I think more stimulus will come out of out of the U.S. and and I think Biden is going to drop more tariffs. I noticed they were talking about dropping tariffs on solar panels coming from China. Of course, that that helps them with with developing more more renewable energy in, in the U.S. because the Chinese build solar panels really cheaply, uh, and in many respects, I think those are subsidized rates that they that they offer. Um, so why not why not buy them? Uh, certainly more wind farms, uh, more electric vehicles, all of that sort of stuff. And I think well, as that, cut, that uh, the faster that comes in, the more that reduces demand, the more that should start to erode oil and gas prices. I know at SP Angel, you're a nomad and broker to a number of uh, small cap companies. Uh, what companies are you looking at particularly, given the market environment at the moment and given where you think things may develop over the longer term? Uh, where are you seeing areas of value? Well, I think we would we would recommend a, a, a sort of basket approach and a portfolio of uh, some of these project companies. Uh, for, so, for example, rare earths, which are critical in wind farms and electric vehicles. Um, a, a good project company there is Rainbow Rare Earths. We would recommend, or on the on the copper side of things, uh, Rambler Metals and Mining, which has a copper mine in Canada, or Arc Minerals, which has recently done a deal with Anglo American. For exploring its properties in Zambia, and Anglo American are effectively putting eighty-five million dollars into that. So it's uh, you know they don't do that without having any reason. We would recommend Atlantic Lithium, which uh, is developing a lithium project in Ghana, and that that's a very good quality project, uh, which is being cornerstoned by uh, Piedmont, which is a com- an American company, uh, which has a, a a deal to sell lithium into Tesla. So that's backed by the great and the good. And Cornish Metals, which is work, working in Cornwall to redevelop the South Crofty tin mine, uh, and also has another project called United Downs, which I'm quite quite excited about. But the main thing is that South Crofty tin mine should hopefully be up and running within a few years, um, and developing tin, which is which is a critical metal uh, for all the circuit boards and uh, connections that that we all rely on. So uh, I think a basket of these stocks is. Is the right way to go, and I think I think they should they should all look good in the next few years. Okay, spreading a risk, John. Thanks so much indeed. That's John Mayer from SP Angel joining us there with a look at uh, the uh, current central bank's uh, intention to combat inflation at the expense of the markets, but in the longer term outlook, there will be some value to be had.